Okay, today is a pleasure to have uh, Goran Sanjanovic from the Grand Sasso Laboratory and uh, ICTP. Uh, I think that many of you know him uh, very well. Uh, he did his PhD at the City College of New York with, uh, the super under the supervision of Ravindra Mohapatra and is one of the co-inventors of the CISO, CISO mechanisms. Then he has been working uh, also in the Brookhaven National Laboratory and the Zagreb University, and he soon moved to the ICTP uh, Trieste. So he's major expert in uh, neutrino physics, unification of uh, fundamental uh, forces, bion and lepton number violation and supersymmetry. And today he's going to tell us about how to find the uh, Majorana neutrinos at the LHC. So, well, Thank you. <coughs> I was told by Juan Jose to try to be pedagogical, and I may be overly pedagogical. I apologize to the experts who's gonna be bored. I hope if they don't hear anything really new, at least maybe some vision, or at least some, some thought that was not familiar to them. I'm gonna give a seminar tomorrow with the more technical aspects, details of this work. So, uh, You probably all of you heard of the boys, Ragazzi di Via Panispena, right? In a span of short years, in a small street near the center of Rome, Fermi was to create a great schools. And many of the boys, many of the guys of the school went on to do great work. Some of them win Nobel Prizes. One of them was standing out, Ettore Majorana. And probably all of you know the legend of Majorana on uh, March 25, the night between March 25 and 26 of 1938, taking a boat ride from Palermo. He was a Sicilian working in Napoli at that time. A 32-year-old, Ettore Majorana was to disappear forever. And it was a loss not just for Italian physics or Italian science, it was a great loss for world science. This is what Enrico Fermi said of Ettore Majorana. He gave a category of various physicists. To the end, he comes to geniuses like Galileo and Newton and compares Ettore Majorana to them. What he lacked was common sense. One of the aspects of this common sense, he wouldn't publish. Okay, it's good to remember this is in the days when we have to publish or perish. So you can imagine he was desperately searched for. Everybody knew that he was a great genius. The first and the logical possibility of a suicide for a loner. He disappeared from physics from the school of Panisperna for some three years before a year before the disappearance. He even wrote a letter to his mother and to his director uh, announcing the possibility of suicide. But then, he takes all his savings and his passport, and that doesn't look like a man who would commit a suicide. He was seen in a monastery in Toscana, oops, sorry, by, by a number of people apparently. When the family goes to talk to the head of the monastery, they are told enigmatically, don't worry, it's important that your son is happy. There was a hope that maybe he lived there. Later on, it was claimed that he lived happily in Venezuela for many years. By the way, recently, Procura di Palermo ends the investigation of the disappearance of Majorana, claiming that they are now have strong indications that he did live in a town of Valencia in, in Venezuela, okay? Well, we are not here to investigate the disappearance, right? It would be nice to know, but it would be dead long ago. What is important that he left us a legacy? A year before, after three years of disappearing, literally from physics, okay, not from, not literally from physics, he wants a job. He decides he wants to come back and, and get a job. Fermi is still influential. This is the era of Mussolini. Fermi, who will have to run away and because his wife is Jewish, makes a deal with people that he can get a job based on a special merit direct fame. He has to produce a paper. And what is amazing, out of the drawer, he takes the manuscript, 
he was never going to publish it, which of course is the essence of our field, okay? And if not for this paper, okay, Juan Jose and the buddies would not be having an ERC grant, right, looking for, for the stuff that we are going to be talking about. If surely my life would have been different in physics, okay, because in my case, most of what I did was based, once I discovered this great work, okay, it helped understand the physics of neutrinos that we are going to talk about, okay. This was last paper because of disappearance, and we are really lucky that. This happened. Now, to appreciate the importance of this work, let me take you back, okay, to something that all of you know, arguably the beginning of particle physics, of modern particle physics, the bombshell of Dirac in 1931, who says there's got to be an anti electron with the same mass. By the way, this is interesting. He's going to take three years of song and dance, okay, just to somehow get the flavor of the time when what you said mattered. As we speak, someone is sending a paper to the archive, right? Writing a simple model with only four or five new particles, okay? And four or five new interactions, okay? Here, saying that there was a new particle would take a genius three years to get courage. Because if you're wrong, that was not good for you. And then, of course, we can say the rest is history. Anderson at Caltech immediately finds the positron. Some years later, it would take some time, antiproton is found. Well, before we come to the modern thing, it's good to know that actually in 1929, Skobelsin in Russia and Chao was a graduate student in Caltech, both of them see the positron. And they talk to their colleagues, and Chao is running around Caltech saying that he sees the particle moving in the opposite direction in the magnetic field. Anderson heard that. This is an interesting thing. There is a message for young people, but I don't want to tell you what it is, okay? <laughs> if you're graduate students, you figure it out yourselves, okay? Uh, what, what will grow out of this is, of course, a uh, kind of dogma that for every particle, we have a different antiparticle for every fermion, which is beautiful, except it may not be true, says Majorana. And what's very, what he says is very simple. A neutral particle. He actually doesn't think of neutrino at that time. He thought that neutron was neutral. Okay. Is is and this is very important. Half of the time, a neutral particle could be, according to Majorana, a particle half of the time precisely antiparticle. That of course immediately tells you that if this guy carries some charge, you will have the violation of that charge by two units. So in particular, lepton number would be violated by two units. This is equivalent, of course, to the famous Majorana mass term. Majorana mass term, it's sort of nice to think about that. It's a kind of situation as if you can annihilate two neutrinos, right, if you look at this mass term or create two of them. It was immediately noticed <coughs> what is now textbook that you get a lepton number violation by two units in neutrino is double beta decay. Desperately search for, still today. Why? Some of you guys here. Raka and Furry of the Furry theorem, okay, he will actually get it clearly. Furry, maybe not Raka immediately. And some almost 50 years later with my friend collaborator Y.E. Kuhn, we came up with the analogous situation I want to show you, the similar process or maybe even the same process can give us the same phenomenon, but much more directly, if we could know what is going on at hadronic colliders such as the LAC. Okay, this is what I want to talk about. And I want to talk about the deep connection that exists between these two processes. So, neutrino is double beta decay. Well, there are situations, Gebert Meyer notices a few years before Majorana that sometimes, uh, the, Beta decay can take place because the outer nucleus is heavier, arsenic is heavier than germanium. So you get a double beta decay depicted here. But then, as we said, if neutrino is Majorana, I can close this line and I get neutrino is double beta decay. And uh, it's proportional to the Majorana neutrino mass, obviously. And therefore, this is claimed to this day that this is a probe of neutrino Majorana mass, okay? This is constantly, I've been going around in public trying to argue that this is not true, okay? And normally we actually show the situation in terms of the effective neutrino mass, so it's good to see it, okay? This depends on the hierarchy. 
if you have a normal hierarchy, the experiments of today and of near future hopefully could come to the inverted hierarchy. They are getting there, not the normal hierarchy in which in we, if we are in the light neutrino regime. Cosmology is slowly but surely limiting neutrino mass from above. So you have an interesting situation in principle you could imagine. Imagine that cosmology tells you that you are in a small neutrino mass regime. Then neutrino could not give an observable neutrino double beta decay. But by the way, the fact that neutrino is not a probe of ne that neutrino has double beta decay is not a probe of neutrino mass. It was noticed more than 50 years ago by uh, Actually, my ex-colleague at Brookhaven, Maurice Goldhaber, a great experimentalist, right, who, as we know, measured neutrino helicity. And it was repeated by Potenkorov. So we are talking about great physicists. So to this day, it is normally ignored. Okay, It is very strange, because they are simply saying, how do you know when you observe neutrino is double beta decay what caused it? It's like seeing proton decay. You will not know what caused it. Okay, there is no way that the low energy process by itself can tell you what is going wrong. This is very important. And you see why, I'm, why I want to emphasize that. This is the contribution that will come from neutrinos, right? You have two exchanges of W boson weak interaction twice. It's proportional to neutrino mass. From the propagator, you get P squared, which is a measure of, of the, uh, the energy is typically involved in this process, around 100 MeV. So you get a certain number. And in the units that I've given here, okay. Notice that if I have new physics that gives me the same process, okay. This is a dimension nine operator. I have six fermions, right? In this six fermions. So uh, if I parameterize it in the same manner, I notice immediately that the scale of new physics should be on the order of few TV. Okay? And this is what makes it very exciting. Just on general grounds, I'll give you an example later on. If the new physics were to be responsible for neutrinos double beta decay, it would be very likely to observe at the LHC. So this is the window that I want to focus on, which I think by far the best window to look for physics beyond the standard model. It's not a question of naturalness or any aesthetic or philosophical principle. Phenomenology itself, if neutrino is double beta decay were to be observed, tells us that there could be new physics just there on the corner. Of course, it could be due to neutrino mass. So we have to investigate what is behind it. So there is, this is a great era. I don't know whether it end, doesn't end up, hopefully, as, as search for proton decay. We have experiment after experiment after experiment. OK, for someone working on this, we love it. I mean, here is the list. I don't want to tell you more about neutrinos double beta decay. You have people who are much more experts here. OK, so talk to Juan Jose. Or, other people here, there are already limits from some of these experiments will tell us that the famous announcement of Clavador probably is not true, okay, or infamous, okay, depends how you feel. Um, the real issue is what next? And I, I, I have nothing to say here. Now, this, what I want to show you in the next part of the talk, that this is deeply related to the origin of neutrino mass. I want to know what neutrino mass is. What is the nature of neutrino mass, right? This is an essential question. Is it really this incredible Majorana thing? But equally important, I would like to know what the origin of neutrino mass is. And here there is a tremendous confusion. The field of the origin of neutrino mass is a funny field. Because what is often not asked is what is the origin of mass itself? Okay, you ask the origin of neutrino mass as if we didn't have <coughs> a great development in understanding the origin of mass. And we think we know, right? We are getting there. It all indicates that the origin of particle masses is the Higgs or Anderson, Braut, Angler, Guralnik, Hagen, Kibble, whatever mechanism, okay, which tells us that particles get masses through the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field. Now, how would you probe that? Ideally, what you want to do, this is already 
emphasized by Weinberg in his classic paper on high temperature, is due to the ideas of Kijnitz and Linde in the early 70s, you would want to see the phase transition because you don't know that you live in this funny vacuum, right? Because you live in this funny vacuum. But if you heat the system enough, you would observe the phase transition. The vacuum expectation value goes to zero eventually. It's just that the temperature is too high and it's science fiction today. So extend what we do. <coughs> What is, what is great in the theory, we have a particle, I think it should be called whole Goldstone, Higgs, Weinberg, Boson. These are the only three people that I've seen had the particle in reading the original literature. And especially the particle we are looking for is actually spelled by Weinberg, after the seed idea of Goldstone and Higgs, which says the following, and you all know this, right? This is textbook that because of, of the Yukawa coupling connection between the Higgs and the fermions and the mass of the fermion, I can predict for every mass a physical process of how Higgs decays into that fermion. This is called the fermion mass problem. Okay, It's my bungling. It's called the fermion mass problem because the immediate question that people ask, well, why is the fermion mass what it is? Okay. So if, if, if you think that this is the issue, okay, then this colloquium is going to disappoint you. I don't care why the number is what it is. What I would like to do is the old-fashioned physics that I correlate one phenomenon to another. So I know how to, <coughs> to probe the origin of charged fermion masses by measuring Higgs or goldstone Weinberg. Well, Higgs, we all call the Higgs branching ratios. And this is going to take some time, right, when, it, when you talk of light fermions. In, in, in theory, it's, it seems easy, it's practice is going to be hard, but the point is that we have a well-defined procedure, well-defined mechanism to know the origin of particle masses. If we want to understand the origin of neutrino mass, we should do the same. That ought to be the first step, I want to argue. Okay. And if you want the rest of the colloquiums, I want to tell you that I do have such a theory, I'll try to convince you, okay, which does the same thing for neutrinos, what Weinberg does for the uh, charged fermions, okay. Again, the uh, still in the textbook part of the talk, you know why neutrino is predicted to be massless in the standard model, it is the left-right asymmetry which is the essential to the theory itself, right? The Majorana mass term is forbidden by the SU2 symmetry or U1 symmetry, okay? So this was a great prediction of the standard model, minimal standard model, and the only one that, that failed. And now this is related to the, uh, to the forbidden question in the standard model. You're not allowed to ask why, or better, how, okay, why is too deep of a question. How is parity broken, right? You live in this completely broken world. Now, I hope you forgive me if I paraphrase a genius. I can <laughs> live with a left-handed God, but I can't live with an invalid. I can live with this, okay. Now, this is something that probably very few people know, that a similar, maybe a bombshell of the one of Dirac, it was 1956 when these two guys, by the way, this is a picture a year later when they already have a Nobel Prize, okay? They look like kids, okay, which they almost wear. Which, of course, reminds you how much of a bombshell that was when they said that the world apparently was not left right symmetric, okay? What is not well known is that the two of them devote a non-trivial part of that paper arguing they cannot be the, such a fundamental symmetry between the left and right, the symmetry, the first symmetry that the child sees. It can't be broken in nature. They believe deeply that at a fundamental level this will be restored. And it's in the form of the so-called mirror fermions, which we know today do not exist, okay. But the point is, I could call it as a Li Yang conjecture, if you wish, that they themselves believe, believed when they wrote the paper. By the way, of course, the, the, what I did brought them great success. And in the days when I was struggling to develop the left right symmetric theory with collaborators, we would, I would often see T.D. Lee when I worked at Brookhaven. He would come in the summer and see an angle was my colleague, basically. He was a Stony Brook. They didn't want to hear about left right symmetry. 
until about a few years ago when Teddy Lee fell in love again and wants everybody in China to look for it. And I had to go give a summary talk and ask him, where were you when I needed encouragement in the old days? Now, how would you make a word left right symmetric in a modern language? This is not 1956, right? This is now the standard model, the 70s, okay? Well, the answer is very simply, just as, as Nike, Nike tells you, just do it. Make the word left right symmetric, and it was done in these original papers in the early 70s. I'm sure you all know that when you do that, what you end up with, you claim that there is a new weak interaction, suppressed because this guy is heavier. But what is more important, you get an automatic prediction of a right handed neutrino. So it turns out you predict the neutrino must be massive. You have a naive expectation <coughs> the neutrino mass should be order of electromass. By the way, it's very naive. And we spent some time, it's, it's funny that Gustavo should be here, because Gustavo Branco and I, when we were together as students at, at City College, we looked into this and it was a mess. You could make it small, but you had to pay a terrible price, okay? Why would we look only at the Dira case? Because my run in the 70s simply didn't exist. There were some funny spinners that you would use in supersymmetry, but as a physical state, they disappeared. In the 50s, people looked for violation of lepton number, never saw it, and it was forgotten. So it looked like a serious curse to many people. Well, I won't speak very much, but it's sort of, if you ever hated the fact that you couldn't remember hypercharge, okay, you may like the fact that in a left-right symmetric theory, hypercharge is just related to B minus L, okay. It may give you a theoretical appeal. There is no clock here, or there is, just to have the sense of time. Okay, I'll do like this. So the curse will turn into a blessing because eventually one will learn that it happens naturally that the right-handed neutrino itself being a singlet on the standard model can and does get a large mass in a version of a theory proportional to the right-handed W boson, which has to be heavy because we didn't see it. And this will lead to the so-called seesaw picture, which become the main paradigm for understanding neutrino mass. According to which neutrino is a Majorana particle, just because right-handed neutrino is a Majorana particle. And the mass is not this Dirac mass term, but it's suppressed by a large mass. So what you have, it's not so much, okay, this is often claimed as an understanding of the smallness of the mass. This would be understanding of the smallness in the mass only if I predict for you MN and if I predict you MD, I can do something about it, I tell you. What is more important to me here is that there is a direct correlation between neutrino mass and a new physical phenomenon, which is parity restoration. When N goes to infinity, this is the standard model, neutrino is massless. But we could, in principle, have new physics accessible at lower energies. There are new gauge interactions, the new gauge bosons. Therefore, we could, in principle, relate neutrino mass to new physics. And this is what we are after. What you see immediately, if there is left, there must be right. This is the new contribution to neutrino double beta decay, which Goldhaber and Feinberg give you on theoretical, on generic grounds. This would be a natural example, so if I have a left-handed W boson and a neutrino my random mass giving me the neutrinos double beta decay, the right-handed version gives the same. And it's very easy to see that with the masses in the TV, this is of course very rough because WR could be heavier and could be lighter, but that it's very easy to see that you could have a situation in which this is the source of neutrino double beta decay and neutrino mass could be very small. Okay. There is no correlation in a physical theory such as this one between not a priori between neutrino double beta decay and, and neutrino mass. Now I can, uh, you see what, 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 in order to tell you how much the 
new physics contributes, I would need to discover WR, right? I would need to know what its mass is. I would need to know the uh, masses of the right-handed gauge bosons and the mixing angles, okay? So, it, you know, we could just wait for LHC to hopefully discover it, but we are restless, of course. So here, I just want to give you an example, an illustration of what will happen. This is called a type 2C, so it's just a name, a situation in which the right mixing is related to the left mixing. By the way, this is not an over-assumption. We don't know much about the left mixings. In a sense that we still don't know the phases, okay? All we know are the angles at the moment, so I'm not over, I'm not doing a, a, a if you discover WR, you could measure these mixing angles. And you have a ratio of N to neutrino masses, just to tell you how much the picture gets changed. You could have a situation in which now normal hierarchy dominates completely, whereas the inverse hierarchy is suppressed, there could still be a, a suppression, okay? This is for a particular mass of WR, of course, LAC accessible, all that I'm saying is here is in the case that WR is there. And this is the combined effect of left and right, okay? Which tells you that neutrino double beta decay is even more encouraged in a theory like this than just with neutrino mass, okay? Now, what's the connection of LAC, you can ask? Well, it's a uh, rotation in plane. You take the, uh, this diagram. This is neutrino as double beta decay, rotate it. Just draw it a little differently. And you have a physical process, right? This on the left-hand side is simply the collider production, the hadronic collider production of WR, right? Drellian mechanism through the exchange of N that gave us two electrons here. I can get two electrons at the colliders, or in general, two same sign charge leptons, which, of course, here, through both for proton and neutron, give me the decay of N into two jets, okay? So let's look at this process, okay? This is the work that we did with Kung in 1983. As I told you a long time ago, it was not noticed. It was gonna pass 10 years before, or nine years before another paper was written on the subject. Maybe a stupid question. Uh, since the right neutrino belong to a double set, right? Yes. How can it be a major particle? Well, the left-handed neutrino can be a Majorana particle because you break a gauge symmetry, remember? After the breaking, in the standard model it cannot happen because you don't have enough, enough, enough states, if you wish. It's, it's not that it could not happen a priori, right? The original symmetry forbids it. So what happens in the, in the, in the this is a very good question, okay? What happens is that, uh, and we'll talk about it tomorrow, that in the process of, 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 of symmetry breaking, by the way, this shouldn't be so surprising. You would even expect on some kind of general ground, if standard model is a good theory, I'm getting too close there. Okay. See, I shouldn't stay there. Okay, it's good. Um, you could think of the decoupling arguments. By the way, what typically happens in the theories beyond the standard model, once you break the, the new symmetry, once the original theory breaks down to the standard model, typically you end up just with the particles of the standard model in which everything decouples. So it is not surprising that the right-handed neutrino decouples and gets a mass by itself, okay? This is fairly natural. In details of the models, we can, we can discuss that tomorrow. And, I, and I'll go through that. It's not automatic, I agree, but it's natural. I don't, it's, it's good enough you're saying, okay. Um, you see, in the old days, there would be a blackboard that I could write a few formulas on the blackboard, okay? But let's wait till tomorrow. Um, oops. So what is this? Okay, I want to show you that this innocently looking diagram gives you actually a lot of physics, okay? As I said, by producing the WR, you would, through the Majorana, right, nature of the right-handed neutrino, that once we accept that it is and it can be 
Uh, by the way, maybe I should just said what I'm saying in this model language is what Weinberg writes in his higher dimensional operator, okay, which I didn't want to introduce. If the states of present physics are just the standard model states, then it is natural in the terms of effective theory. It is natural, but of course, what I'm trying to do here is actually not to argue in some natural scenario, whatever language. I want to present to you a theory just the way the standard model was the theory of charge fermion. This does this job completely okay. Let's see if I manage. So what you have, you would have the direct lepton number violation at colliders, okay? Which I find personally very exciting because this is like saying baryon number violation at colliders, something we dream about in underground laboratories, okay? We would also be able to reconstruct these particles, okay? This is the great thing about LHC, of course, or an equalizer, because I measure the energies and momenta of final states, and I measure the mass of WR and masses VR. And so on, my, my student Juan Vasquez looked at this, some details recently. Okay, what is, what is even more exciting? Those of us that appreciate the greatness of my runner work, is that imagine that you produce this guy on shell, Fairly natural, a fermion being lighter than the gauge boson that we have so many of them in the standard model. What happens then is that this guy, remember what my runner is, half time a particle, half time antiparticle. It's kind of hermaphrodite that cannot decide what it is. So half of the time it decays into a lepton and half of the time into an anti-lepton. It's not just lepton number violation. You would actually directly probe and my run in Asia or a right handed neutrino. And I'll argue that in turns will tell you a lot about left handed neutrino because I'll argue that the theory is complete. So, this is a picture how the things would look like. Because of this no missing energy, this process has very little background in red. So, when you go to high energy, this is in GeV, the peaks would be the masses of WR. The background goes to zero fairly quickly. So even with a reasonably small amount of events, you could discover WR in principle, and you could go to the energies about 6 TV if you were to reach high luminosity, which looked exaggerating some years ago, but it's becoming fairly plausible to most of us that we may reach eventually this. Uh, this is a courtesy of Fabrizio Neste. For which value? Uh, Oh, here I'm taking a left-right symmetric theory. Now, of course, you can argue what if the symmetry is broken at high energies, okay, there will be some running. What I tell you doesn't depend that I need the coupling to be precise, even as some small running would preserve this picture. What is important in this, by the way, it's not just the gauge coupling here, it's the mixing angle. A profound question that was, be, that was a holy grail in the theory for 40 years is, could I give to you this mixing angle here? Before the symmetry breaking, the, the left and right, everything is the same, but after symmetry breaking, there is no reason that left and right should be the same. So the question is, even if the gauge coupling were of the similar order, what about this mixing could be completely different, okay? This problem was finally solved, and this is what I wanna talk about uh, uh, last year. And we just wrote a longer paper with my student, Vladimir Tello. And I'll give you some details. So, so we are we are here, and now what is the connection with neutrino mass, right? This is the uh, this is the question, a fundamental question that I need to ask in order to claim that I have a theory of neutrino mass. Remember in the CISO formula, what was crucial that I need a Dirac. mass or vice versa. If I were to make your prediction of a neutrino mass, I would have to know what a Dirac mass is. And the people often look into some kind of ones that is for this mass, okay, which I think is, is taking the problem upside down. The thing what I'm trying to emphasize here is that we can measure the right-handed neutrino masses, we can measure the left-handed neutrino masses. The issue is can I go back and predict the, uh, the Dirac mass term? For the experts here, I'm sure the experts know that in the context of a standard so-called CISO, okay, I'll, sorry, I'll come to that. I'm rushing ahead of myself. 
Now, what is important that because of left right symmetry, and left right symmetry can be parity, in which everything that is left goes into right, or it can be charge conjugation. Charge conjugation is just like parity, remember, right? CP is practically a good symmetry, but the fermion goes into fermion star. So in this case, it's, it's easier to illustrate the point. I'll discuss this tomorrow. I can show that the Dirac mass term has to be symmetric. And remarkably enough, this is enough for me to predict it. Okay. In other words, if I measure the right-handed neutrino masses, and I measure the left-handed neutrino masses, okay, what makes you nervous in the beginning? It took us some time how to work with the square root of matrices. Okay, it's not it's not trivial, but it can be done. I can compute. So the Dirac mass theorem, and that means I can compute the Yukawa Dirac. That means I can compute physical processes associated with that. And this is the complete analog of what Weinberg did in the charge fermion case. This is what I want to argue, that what we have achieved is what we will call the goldstone higgs weinberg prediction for charge fermions. In the case of parity, it's more messy. And we didn't write the paper yet because the formulas are selling it, but the same thing is true. So what happens is that you have a leading decay. Remember, the right-handed gauge boson, as you asked me, is a part of the doublet. So of course, it decays into the right-handed gauge boson, or through it, better to say, because it's heavy. And the fermion, which of course, there should be R sub subscript, which I forgot here. What is crucial, I have a chirality here. Of a, and however, through this Yukawa Dirac or through the M Dirac, there will be mixing between heavy and light neutrino. And therefore, I can also decay into left-handed lepton. Okay, this is subleading. What is important, I can plot for you this branching ratio. If I knew, I would be able, if I knew the masses of WR and the masses of the right-handed gauge boson of the right-handed. Neutrinos here is the plot as the mass of neutrino. Again, we illustrate in this so-called type 2C, so M Dirac takes a more elegant form. Just for illustration, please, I'm not claiming that I want to do some kind of ansatzes here. Okay, this is opposite what I'm after. I want the experiment to give me the numbers and then plot them in. I just want to tell you that the branching ratio, there are, it's normally small, so you need a lot of events. There is even a range in which there may not be science fiction. The study of the chiralities was done in a number of papers, okay, starting from Ferrari et al. in 2000 and recently by Tao Han and collaborators who claim that it's feasible, therefore we have a way of probing this, this situation. The question is, what about the left-right scale? Why is it that I'm telling you this 40 years uh, after the theory was created? Why would you speak about this old physics? Okay. And the thing is that for many years, many of us, myself for sure, didn't want to work on this because there was a theoretical limit. We knew it from the early 80s. The WR had to be heavy because of the way it contributes strongly to the K-long, K-short mass difference. Okay, there is a conspiracy of factors, an interesting conspiracy of factors. I remember we didn't want to do the calculation of Hapatra and myself because we said the diagram could be order one compared to left-left and got the enhancement of about a thousand. Sometimes you, well, well, maybe with better intuition we could have done it, but sometimes you should also sit down and compute as these people did. And it turned out that WR had to be happy. There were discussions, okay, this was finally settled in a paper by Alessio Maietza et al. a few years ago. Alessio is here. They went on Alessio and to look into this more carefully. I don't want to talk about it here because finally experiment is catching up. This is slowly becoming obsolete. And for example, this is a CMA paper from the last year. You can see this is the mass of WR. That for a big range of right-handed neutrino masses that we are interested in, those that we give us the effect of probing the Majorana nature, the limit is now even bigger than the theoretical one. There is still a small mass of right-handed neutrino <coughs> that is worth discussing. But these are now details that I may leave for tomorrow. 
So as you can see, there are two reasons that it makes sense. Well, almost any physics that we are studying beyond the standard model was suggested a long time ago. We simply had to wait for LHC. OK, this is obvious. But I wanted to show you that there were theoretical developments that make things interesting. By the way, there are a number of people that are jumping on this. Every day I see a different paper from a different explanation. There is a two-point sigma excess in this dilepton channel in the same CMS paper. OK, they didn't do bright Wigner. They took WR uh, and they took a single N with a half WR mass. So I don't know what, what it is. I, 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 I'm sure that, as usual, the anomalies that tend to go away in the standard model. Just want to tell you that people are working on this. And what is interesting, they don't get the equal amount of same and opposite sign events, which is a manifestation of Majorana nature. In other words, this means that these Majorana guys would have to conspire to become some kind of pseudo Dirac. Okay, that happens when you have degenerate particles, okay. You see that already becomes very unappealing. They have to be quite degenerate, okay, but it's possible. There is no muon excess, so you do a couple that there is a recent paper that shows that this is perfectly possible. This is below the theoretical limit, so that's another reason why probably you should ignore it. But these people claim that they think they can even get it since there was no bright Wigner with larger WR and different mass distribution. OK, maybe. By the way, every day there is a different explanation of this. I even see people saying in MSSM. And this ought to be forbidden, OK? Because there is no way that you don't have a phenomenon in the MSSM. There are so many particles, so many interactions, that there is no phenomenon. I've been struggling to imagine a phenomenon. Of course, you can try some modification of gravity or whatnot, many particle physics, which is not there in MSSM. So this is sort of uh, what I want to say about this left-right thematic theory. So I don't know if there is a question. This could be also a moment to ask it now. Before I go to something which I would call scenarios or custom fit models, you can see from the name that I'm not too crazy about it. And this is typically the way one says. One says, a posteriori, I know that neutrino has a mass. I don't want to create any theory. I don't want to look at any theory. I just want to close my eyes. And I want to make the simplest change I have. Sorry, sorry. I want to make the simplest change of the standard model. So I add right-handed neutrinos to the standard model. I assume that they are heavy, and I get a CISO formula. Okay. By the way, this is not the way it happened. The original papers actually anticipated experiment in the original paper, especially the left-right and SO10, the right-handed neutrino had to be. It's not that we went back to say what we should do to get the neutrino mass. But anyway, this is called C. So there is an immediate setback when you don't have a theory. And this is the one that experts know, that this formula cannot be inverted. You see, because what you want to, either that you predict this M Dirac or MN to tell you what neutrino mass is, okay, because what I want to say here, that this is not a theory of anything, how can it be a theory of neutrino mass? I don't even know why this should be heavy, right-handed neutrino. Or better to say that in order to make predictions for whatever thing, like leptogenesis that people look at, I would need to have, know the Dirac mass term. But there is an inherent problem because it cannot be determined. And it's actually quite bad because this O here, it's very easy to plug it in because of transpose. This is an arbitrary complex orthogonal matrix. And it's not known that the values are arbitrary. They can be arbitrary large. Orthogonal matrices real have values which are less than one, right, matrix elements. This can be arbitrary large because it's complex. So you don't even know why neutrino would be light. Some people are playing with that, trying to produce a right-handed neutrino through this cancellation, through taking large O. But then, of course, it's contrary to the spirit of what you were trying to say when you went to this picture. But anyway, I don't know. I see Pauli turning in his grave. You know, it's, it's really hard to be wrong. You can do something else. This is called type 2C. So 
you can say I don't want to add right handed neutrinos, I will add another particle. Again, you are doing custom fit model. You said you tell me the neutrino is massive. I ask myself what I should do. I add a triplet of scalars, which of course can couple to two Higgses. They are doublets. If you wish, maybe it would help you understand that if I had a triplet of scalar in a left-right symmetric theory, then the right-handed neutrino could get a mass. The same way that if I have a triplet of scalars in the left-handed theory, okay, which here I just add, then, then I can get a, a, a neutrino mass. There is no connection now between LAC and neutrinos double beta decay. It doesn't enter into neutrinos double beta. Again, it's a physics by itself. There is something maybe better than before, the existence of, of the doubly charged particle which decays into lepton pairs with precisely the same coupling here. So you could say you could be. It gets a little easier to be wrong. Assuming that this guy is light, okay, just what is interesting, this is actually a part of a left-right thematic theory that I may talk about tomorrow. You could, go, you, could, you could do more, you could say, well, I go on, I will introduce something else. It turns out I can introduce a triplet fermion instead of introducing a, a, a singlet right-handed neutrino here. I could put a triplet. Notice this is a doublet. A doublet, it can also give me a triplet. So once I notice that in a diagram, you can say I can, uh, what's wrong if I just put a, a CISO, a triplet fermion. There is a sort of interesting theory, SU5, minimal SU5 theory, in which these guys are predicted to be light, which I worked on with borrowed bytes, but by itself I find it very appealing. People do more, they had high representations of fermions. I think you can see that I don't like it. So look, I try to argue that uh, there is a theory that gives you understanding of the origin of parity violation, weak interactions, and by itself it brings you a new structure, new currents, new physical processes, okay. It gives you neutrino mass. It gives you lepton number violation and colliders. This is deeply connected, as I was telling you, to neutrino is double beta decay. And it gives you the CISO and the right-handed neutrino, but you say, I don't give a damn. Forget your gauge currents, forget these processes, forget I just like my right-handed neutrino. Okay, go back to the standard model. What was beautiful about the standard model? Why did some of us fell in love in 1973? Some maybe a little before when we discovered that it was there. It gives you electroweak unification, it gives you gauge structure, it gives you W to Z mass ratio, predicts all kinds of interesting new physics, okay? It gave you neutral currents well predicted. And you observe this neutral current and say, I don't give a damn. Forget all this beautiful physical, just put a Z boson and study some Z boson by hand and study the physics, okay? I hope it's not what. You will agree, it's not what we should be after. So I try to argue, I'm finishing my talk, that, that left-right theory is a complete predictive theory, neutrino mass. The trouble is, of course, it needs LHC. Okay, I admit a weakness, and this is not surprising because there is no new physics yet observed beyond the standard model, new physics in terms of the actual processes. So I don't know what the scale is, okay. The usual problem is there. Once, once LHC, where to give it, we could have a situation coming from LAC that we could probe the origin of neutrino mass. We could also know why parity and how, or better to say, is violated. We could have directly observed lepton number violation. We could see my run and nature when, and remember through the prediction of the Dirac mass term, I can give you then exact numbers for neutrino mass. 
and processes. This, I think, what is very exciting is directly related to low energy experiments. Okay, we are talking about the processes at the same time scale. The next 10, 15 years are going to be very exciting, okay, because there is a deep connection, okay. I didn't talk about lepto flare relation, which is obviously there. There are other dipole moments and so on processes. But the particular one, notice that I have focused on what I believe is the, is the would be a great discovery, a violation of what, what appeared to be a fundamental law of nature or started to grow into a dogma of a law of nature is, of course, what is most exciting for us. Thank you. Gracias. Okay, thank you very much for this pedagogical talk. And we have some time for questions. So it's very nice to have these connections between different processes, as you say, but in terms of sensitivity, I mean, if you assume just natural numbers for everything you don't know, so you, you I mean, is neutrinos double beta decay more sensitive to than LHC or uh, for these uh, models or? It's, I not, think it's not so obvious, I mean. Yeah, it's not so obvious, no, this is a good question. I, I wouldn't say what is more natural, like, I always see this problem, what is more natural. Um, I remember in 1981, I wrote a paper with Marciano on supersymmetric unification, and we end up, ended up saying that the top quark should weigh 200 GeV. Otherwise, it wouldn't work, supersymmetric unification. Everybody thought that this is crazy, this is not natural. How can you guys imagine a number like that? It's so unnatural that theta 1, 3 will have to be very small. Okay, and that's not natural again, okay. So this is the injury. I think the better question is the sensitivity of what is, where I can go to higher masses. There is almost one-to-one -one correspondence, but actually neutrinos double beta decay is more sensitive. I have a plot which I don't have here, I think. But vaguely I can tell you it can easily see WR up to 10 TeV. Whereas LHC stops at eight, uh, 6 TeV. So the energy of the LHC Okay, if I, were, uh, uh, if I were working on supersymmetry or strings, I should tell immediately people build me a new collider in China because then I, <laughs> I, I, I would have to go to a new collider to beat neutrino double beta decay. This is why I'm very excited about neutrino double beta so decay. Is also true for lepton flavor violation? Lepton flavor violation is also more sensitive. You could even imagine that there could be a problem of lepton flavor violation, but it's, it, it turns out it is not. Yes, the low energy processes, unfortunately, can probe physics which goes to high energies. The unfortunate truth about supersymmetry or whatever theory be on the standard model, right? I could have supersymmetry at 3 TeV, 4 TeV, 5 TeV, 8 TeV, he still wants to give me a tremendous amount of flavor violation. So he wants, but then again, he may not. So, uh, that, do you think these left right symmetric models shed any light on the naturalness issue? No. In general? No. No, I've. I've, I've no, the thing that I can say only. The lower the scale, the less I have to worry about what the high scale. You know, people often tell you, look, but Goran, wouldn't it be more natural if uh, Dirac Yokawa was a water one and the scale was uh, 10 to the 14 GeV? Of course, this creates immediately a hierarchy problem. I mean, what is a hierarchy problem, by the way? What is a naturalness problem? Just for assuming that the graduate students were not completely familiar. The question is, why is Higgs light? So you ask, well, what do you mean, why is Higgs light, compared to whom? And that's a very tricky question because people say, well, compared to, tell me someone, what is the scale that you worry about? There is only scale that we've seen in Asia is this scale. So the question is a bit funny, but you say, look, there is gravity. I think it was 1985 when I first saw Glashow is very unhappy about this problem in 1985, the first string revolution, he says, well, instead of writing G Newton as 1 over M Planck square, why don't you write it as G square or M glacial square, say? He doesn't say that. If G is small, the scale would be small. In modern language, that's called ADD program. They tell you that this coupling is small because extra dimensions are large. Okay, but it's just a realization of, the, uh, of this possibility. Then, of course, you can say, well, there is also a grand unification scale, but these are imaginary scales. So I'm a little worried to worry about the naturalness, as I did a lot in the past, 
as the time went on, I'm not sure even how you phrase that. Okay, so sorry that I'm making it long. I just want to say that if you do worry about naturalness, we are in the same boat if WR is life. <laughs> Um, maybe this is a comment. You stressed that in the left-right symmetric theory you make a link between what can be observed at LHC and the neutrinos double beta decay. But actually, through this decay of the heavy N particle, you can also measure matrix elements that are different from M, E, E. Because of course you can measure decay into any lepton. So you, are, you have access to other operators that are right. not the one in the routine list. That, right. that is also interesting. Right, right. No, you could, you could, we can, I can tell you a lot about flavor violation. I can tell you immediately, right? If I measure this, I could predict lepton flavor violation. I could do it. tell you. Well, I considered it here. I, I've, okay, I could have done that. I know that there is a lot of activity here in neutrino is double beta decay. I also wanted to concentrate on one fundamental thing, which is seeing this real, Majoran and HR, okay, which means lepton number violation. But I agree with you. Actually, in order to produce the numbers, when I when I when I gave here some numbers, I don't know if I can do it quickly. No, I'm going in the wrong direction. Sorry. Here, if there were questions, there are, there are some answers here. <laughs> I don't know if the question. Maybe I won't be able to come quickly. For example, here, when I give you this various example, I have to worry about lepton flare violation. You know, the inputs, you have to check that you don't have too much lepton flare violation. Okay, you can, I can find you, I could show you some interesting correlation. I wish, since you are asking that, that I brought the diagram with me. LHC would, would in principle tell you everything then what it has to be at low energies, okay? But why in the world should we be exciting at this at LHC? We should see something at low energies first so that we believe that there is new physics accessible at LHC. I mean that, even that, remember, I could be above. The good thing is I have very small window, okay? Once again, it's about 10 TeV that is sensitive to neutrino double beta decay, then, then it disappears. More questions? Okay, Gustavo. Oh. Uh, maybe just a critical okay, question. So, you made the connection with the double beta decay and new physics via dimension 9 operator. So, he has. understand why it was dimension 9. And well, because it's. Well, you see it here, right? I have six fermions. Here, what I said that I have six fermions, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And that makes it dimension nine, but you can see it more explicitly. Look, the way I parameterize it, right? This is a measure of neutrino virtuality. It comes from a neutrino propagator proportional to m nu, mm -hmm. and I have G Fermi square. So notice dimension is one over the mass. I parameterize with the same gauge coupling. Okay, here, here this was very rough because yeah. if the coupling is somewhat different, the scale could go, sure. as I said, to 10 TeV. Okay, with the more or less the same parameterization, I go to a few TeV. Notice it has to be lambda to the fifth power just on the on these dimensional grounds, but it's also here from the six, uh, that this being a six fermion operators. Uh, I notice I'm still on time, okay, so therefore if you, if there are questions, okay. I've, I've stopped a little earlier, just I'm hoping that there will be questions, okay. I, I'm only the talk short, I, Gustav. You emphasized the connection with left-right symmetric theories, which I like, personally, I like very much, and I hope they will be discovered. No, in, we, we say, in, in Croatia, we say, from your mouth into the <laughs> God's ear. Yeah, right. okay, so now, uh, I'm just uh, wondering if, uh, on a historical uh, question is, I don't know if you have asked yourself this question, you know, I have asked and I have a possible answer. Uh, you know, why didn't the builders of the standard model, like Weinberg, Lash or Salam, why they did not introduce new R? My interpretation is that they were afraid that if they would introduce new R, then they will have immediately Dirac uh, mass, you know, and in order to justify the smallness of neutrinos, they will have to say that the coupling is very small, which again is nothing wrong. 
but it will be, I think, so they made, they got, they got away with the idea of new war not being introduced. But if they had introduced new war, and they, of course they will have a Dirac mass, they will not know why it should be too small, but if they would have also followed the principles at that time, which was write the most general Lagrangian consistent with unrisability and gauge invariance, then they would have to introduce a Majorana mass for right hand neutrino. And I, I think that's my interpretation, I may be wrong, that probably they either had forgotten or didn't know about Majorana masses. If they have done that, you know, I'm reconstructing history, you know. I know that this is not, you emphasize that, and you are right. This is not the way things went. But it could, it could do you agree with me that this no. is. The, Oh, you don't. <laughs> but but this could have happened. No, I, 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 why? So how you would answer why did not introduce new art? I, I will. Okay. Um, what did they write? As Gustavo says, they wrote the theory in which you write the most general interaction consistent with the gate symmetry. Which it turned out gave you renormalizability, not consistent with renormalizability. They had no idea how to get renormalizability. It's sort of, no, no, just, no, just no, a side no, comment. Yeah, yeah. Just a side comment. It's interesting. Glacier says, forgive me, you know, I put a W boson mass by hand, and I know there is a problem. A year before Glacier, 1961, Weltmann and Van Damme, just there are some graduate students, showed that there is a problem with renormalizability of, of Young Mill theory. So Glacier knows that there is a problem. Why back sex? Maybe I'm improving it when he ends the Higgs mechanism into the model, but he doesn't know how to, to deal with it. Okay. So what was the crucial thing about the construction of the theory? What what is the crucial word when you write a new theory? What is the crucial word when Maxwell writes the theory of Einstein theory of gravity? It's whatever the principles they used plus minimality. Once they give up minimality, they would open Pandora's box. You don't know what you are going to add, what not to add. So if I add a right-handed neutrino, which is a gauge singlet, I'm losing all the beauty of the gauge principle, which connects one phenomenon with another. So I would say I would never introduce a right-handed neutrino if I am Weinberg for two reasons. It's not a minimal theory. Second, if I'm introducing this particle, why not tens of other particles? Okay. Remember at the time, neutrino looked massless. I very often was told, I remember by same glass show of the standard model, uh, his buddy George, I, that I was wasting my time when I was worried about neutrino mass. They knew neutrino was massless. This also fitted very nicely in the SU5 minimal gut. Neutrino was massless. And the. Um, that was the continuation. And, and the solar, yeah, well, it, it came soon. And you know, slowly the solar puzzle would, 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 there was an interesting thing also that probably because of his escape into communism, Ponte Covo's work was completely ignored in the West, by and large, in the mainstream. So we have a number of reasons why to stick to the minimal model. All the predictions that I have here, the nature of neutral currents and so on, is minimality. So I'd say no, don't do that. Because if you do that anyway, remember, uh, let's do it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's moving. No, no, but let's do it. No, I have to now. Ah, uh, you see. You see what I said? This is a theory. This is a difference between scenarios, ad hoc assumptions, custom fee model, and the theory. In this case, I actually predict the form of the Dirac mass matrix. If you wish, the, the O, orthogonal matrix of, of Casas and Ibarra, that is just a way of parameterizing. By the way, it's very funny. It became famous. There are many different ways you can parameterize. It's, it gets fixed. It's simply a given number. Okay. A difference between a theory and a scenario in which you say, okay, I had a right-handed neutrino and I get that, but you, you, you've done nothing when you add, add that because nothing is correlated with nothing. You don't even know that you added a right-handed neutrino, by the way. Now, of course, yeah, what this Gustavo is says... General, but this is general when you have a theory with more parameters that you can measure. No, when you have a theory with more parameters, then usually if there is a theory, the theory correlates these parameters with other parameters. This is not a theory. No, I, I really insist on this. This is not a theory of anything. This is the same standard model in which you added a, a particle or a couple of particles. This is not a new theory. Because if you call this a theory, then I will immediately write 
let's say in the next 48 hours, you and I can write another 10 different theories by adding different particles to it, okay? Yeah. And you will see that there are no theory, they're gonna suffer from the same setbacks, serious setbacks. And that th th they are not theories. Well, I don't understand what you mean by they, by, by they are not theories. I mean, if you write down a whole bunch of writing your particles, of course there are more parameters in that model than in the standard model, and most of those parameters you don't know. So to me, this whole matrix there is just the same. No. I mean, there are more parameters if you add extra uh, right-handed neutrinos to the standard model, and you cannot measure them. Right, but once again, because this is not a theory. The theory was the one in which I was forced to add the right hand in a neutrino due to the gauge structure, and then these parameters are fixed by the theory. This is what I insist, okay? Remember, look, I gave you at the end, I gave you, um, I said the following. You go back and you tell me <coughs> that you don't like That, that there was a standard model. You observe the ultra currents, you say, I don't give a damn, I'm just gonna add a Z boson, some scalar particle even, I don't know before whether it's a gauge boson or not, to the, to the W boson and I will limited that. You will have nothing. You're gonna have, for every different ultra current process, you'll add a new parameter very often, okay? What the standard model did, and this is why we call it a theory, or, I would call it a theory. It's called a model. It's a funny thing of language, okay? It's surely theory because it was the conceptual, the structural aspect of what Glacier wrote that gave you that phenomenon. It was not a custom fit scenario of discovering the process and you going back and throwing some particles, okay? This is different. It's not, it will be like you are saying that light bends no? And you were saying, well, forget Einstein, I'm gonna add something that makes line bend, I'll add a new particle that couples light to the sun, okay? And you will be faced with the impossibility to correlate that to other processes. And this is where Einstein had a theory, and I would call this a scenario, what you are doing. A custom fit model, which goes into the name of model building, which is one of the reasons that I claim that Phil is confused, because as we speak, someone is sending another model, and these to me are like... But well, I mean, you can have a very predictive model, but nevertheless, you are adding more parameters, right? So, fundamentally, you are doing the same thing. I mean, the theory is still renormalizable, uh, you know, you are not violating any principle, any symmetry principle. You are just trying to explain something that you cannot explain to the minimum. Or you can look at the theory which has this structurally, okay? If you see tomorrow. Maybe it's more predictive. Of course it's more predictive. To, to add the whole thing. Well, I, I, I. So in that sense it's nicer, but, but I, I mean, I, I don't. No, I, I, mean, I, I, mental difference between these two. To me, this is uh, an discussion you want to keep in the world tomorrow. Right. Yes. More questions? Yeah. Right. <laughs> And we do have a fundamental difference here in, 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 in taste. In, in, in. Well, I, 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 you know, I could say let's leave it for tomorrow, but it's good to have these things in public, okay? It's only a question of taste whether you want to study theories. If you see proton decay tomorrow, you can just throw a particle that you like to give you proton decay. I would sit down immediately and restudy. I spent years trying to predict proton decay from grand unification. It was not easy. I would go back to the drawing board, to the blackboard and I would look at that because that's the theory that structurally gave me proton decay and not reinvented to give it to me. It can't help it. So I just finished on this note for this question that the right-handed neutrino was a must in the theory. Neutrino mass was predicted years before experiment. That's a natural framework to look at, I would say. That's why I kept looking into it, okay, because it was there. Anyway. Okay, any other question? If not, thanks again for this nice talk.